Summit Church in Fort Wayne, Indiana. It's such a blessing to have him here with us. Um, we do have a gift bag for you. I'm sorry, I don't know which one it is, but maybe I'll look in here. And this would be correct. This is for you and your lovely wife. This is for Al and Carla Jennings, thanking them and honoring them for being God's gracious grace pioneers, sharing their lives, God's love and grace, and the true gospel with the world. So thank you so much, sir. Yes. God bless. All right. Okay, I'm taking your time. Good. Hi, everybody. Hi. There you go. All right, so shout out to my hot wife. She is uh, at home now, and uh, she chose to sit out this one. And she keeps the joy in the house. It's always a blessing. Uh, she never complains. I knew a guy once, um, I still know him, um, he, every time I would, he used to, he used to, he used to do my table, and uh, every time I'd ask him, like, I, I wouldn't want to ask him this, like, how's, how's the family? Because he'd always say the same thing, breathing and complaining. <laughs> he said, if they stop doing one of those two things, I work. <laughs> every time, he's, he's not. He ended up getting a divorce, but he's remarried. Hopefully he doesn't say that anymore. But uh, Carl and I just celebrated 40 years of uh, being married. Yeah, we went to Cancun, and this first time there, we had, a, we had a great time, just wanted to relax. So I know Brad and Gwen and Julie were so just one year, right? It's awesome. Give my hand. So, um, people want to know the secret of marriage, um, be friends. It's not the only thing, but that works. Um, another tip, um, when you're married one year, you uh, newlyweds, young couples, when you're married one year, husbands, take your wife somewhere exotic, as far away as you can. If, possible in another country, just go and have a blast for, after one year, okay? Maybe Australia. And then uh, on the 40th year, go back and get her. Oh, <laughs> and then go to, well, this is great, Dan, right? This is great. <laughs> so uh, in a meeting like this, you never know what can happen when the Lord leads you to come to, to any, any meeting, just follow the Lord. Sometimes things don't look like when you show up. I had a, an experience like that in ministry um, even before I came under a revelation of grace. I was led to go to this meeting when Carla was uh, pregnant with our daughter Jasmine. And uh, she was about to deliver and it was getting really close to the delivery time, but I was led to go to this meeting. So I asked her permission if I could go. I, I said, I really feel I should go to this meeting. It was about two, two hours away in Lansing. It was close enough for me to get back home. So I went, and uh, she, she said, that's cool. So I went. Back then, anybody old enough to remember pagers? They had these pagers back then. And no cell phones. So I had the pagers ready to get back in. You know, she was size contracted or whatever. And so, but I really felt in my heart I was supposed to go to this meeting and they sent me, the minister that um, sponsored this meeting, it, it was at a host church. He, he was actually from Tulsa, but um, the host church was in uh, East Lansing, Michigan. He said in the letter they had a minister session. So I get there and uh, there's a lady at the door, sweet lady. And I asked her where it was the minister section. And she looked at me with a big smile and she turned around and looked at everybody and said, we're all ministers. And I was like, okay. Um, and I just go sit in the back. You know, I, I knew what she meant by that. I know every believer is a minister. I, I, I get that. And I wasn't trying to be disrespectful to anybody. I just, you know, that's what the letter said, but cool. I'm going to sit in the back. 
I don't need a seat in the front. So I go and, and sit, and then at this meeting, people were going up and having hands laid on them. This particular minister was ministering. People were falling under the power of God. It was, it was powerful. But I, I'm a kind of person that I'm not always the first one to go. I just kind of check things out. I wasn't objecting to anything. I was just checking stuff out. So um, these ladies kept going back, getting hands laid on, go back two, three times. And they were sitting, sitting in my row, and they kind of look over at me. <laughs> now, I already had the greeting at the door. And I'm like, I thought the Lord led me to come to this meeting. And so the ladies looked at me, they, they finally spoke up and they said, you're not gonna get nothing, just sitting there. I was like, okay. So like, I'm cool. And so finally, second night I went up and I, I'm sure those ladies were happy. And so I went up and uh, the lady laid hands on me. I fall out under the power of God. And uh, it was awesome. I was just laying there, and the guest had a lady who could really sing. She was a psalmist, and she was singing. And all of a sudden, she turned around, she told the minister in charge, she said, I believe the Lord want to bless that man financially. Now, nobody knew who I was. Um, I'm a pastor, but nobody knew. I was just sitting in the back minding my own business. So the next thing I know, the lady in charge had the ushers come up and, and they were putting buckets. All, I'm still on the floor and they put buckets all around me. Next thing I know, people started coming up and putting money in the buckets. And at the end, they ended up receiving an offering from me like $1,700. And then when I got back home, they said they misallocated some money, so it was $900. So I ended up with $2,600 for a meeting, and uh, nobody knew who I was. So at the meeting, before I left, the lady at the door said, I'm so sorry, she apologized. She said, I, I didn't know there was a minister's staff. So I, I learned about having a good attitude. Yes. Just no matter what, you follow what the Lord tells you to do. Right. And so, um, and then those ladies that was bothering with me about when I was going to go up, they came up to me and said, I see you got something. <laughs> yeah, so I said that to say, I'm going to get to my grace story. But, um, it was a part of my journey, and um, it's just following the Lord, and sometimes you, you may not know why the Lord has you so much, but follow, follow the Lord. Like, he'll have some things for you that, uh, that you don't know about. And so, um, Steve McIntosh, who came here earlier, he's the one who introduced grace to me. I had a meeting with him in, in Indianapolis. He's about an hour and 45 minutes from me. And uh, he wanted help with his Facebook page, so I was there. I thought to help him with that. But actually, the Lord had me meet with him about grace. That's really what the meeting was all about. So when I met with him, we talked about the Facebook stuff. And somehow, I don't know how we got on the subject, but he started talking about how his ministry has changed. And he no longer taught that, like, we, we both were in, in a word of faith uh, type ministry. And so he was like, well, I used to think that God's blessings and his favor was based on your performance. Okay. And I said, well, okay. Like, I don't teach that. I did. But my initial reaction was, well, I don't have any just any justice in me. I don't, I don't teach that way. And then, but the more I start thinking about it, well, I'll get to that later. He he shared something else with me about First John one nine. 
that you don't have to confess your sins in order to be forgiven. You were already forgiven 2,000 years ago on the cross. It's like, oh, well, I know I don't teach that. And I, I don't know about that one. But I listen. And uh, I like to have an open mind about things. I don't know everything. Um, so I had a our 45 minute ride back home. I, I listened and, and on my way back home, the Lord shared with me, no, you, you don't have what he's talking about. I was like, oh, okay. And I thought about it. And the more I thought about it, I, I taught that the Lord's blessings was conditional. Now I, I had the right definition of love, un unconditional, I, I mean, agape, unconditional love, but I preached, taught, acted like it was conditional. That's right. That you had to do this to get that. All right? And uh, one of the things Steve shared with me, he encouraged me to read Destined to Rain by Joseph Prince. Now, I, I had seen Joseph Prince on television, but it never really registered. I never stopped and listened to what he was saying. I heard him say some things about grace. Oh, he talks about grace. But I didn't really know the grace uh, revolution or revelation or anything like that. And I thought, he looked kind of cool, but I, I never really paid attention to what he was saying. And so Steve encouraged me to read that book. But when I got home, there was a a friend of mine who was, who actually uh, started with me in ministry, he was one of the initial members years ago, and um, one of the founding members of our, of our ministry, and in the winter, he would go to Atlanta, he had a daughter that lived there, and he had a, another place there that, you know, take a little break from the cold in Indiana. And so while he was in Atlanta, in the winter, he went to Creflo's church. Creflo Dollar. Anybody heard of him? Yeah. Okay, so he went to, uh, y'all still awake? He's tough at yeah. a lunch meeting, man. <laughs> it's like, it's like, we, we've been here a long time. But uh, so I heard after I talked with Steve, he had a friend that he Steve connected me with that said Creflo's teaching had changed. I said, oh, look. And then, and my lightning quick down, I said, okay, my, my, my friend goes down there in the winter. I'm not wondering what, if he's been here. I found out later, not only him, but there's his business partner had got a revelation of grace. A couple other people in our ministry had a revelation of grace and didn't tell me. All right? So I called this gentleman, and he, then he began to tell me, we talked on the phone for two hours and he started preaching to me what he had been learn learning from, from, from Creflo. Like, wow. And then, um, man, I, I, th th that's when the journey started. I, I don't just take things because a preacher said it. I gotta find it out for myself. I gotta get a revelation for myself in the Word. And I dug in the Word and I found out those things Steve McIntosh and Joseph Prince were saying was true. Before I even got to the book, and Dust in the Rain, when I got to that, man, it was all over when I read that. And I got up in the pulpit and I said, look, y'all, I've been teaching y'all some wrong stuff. Not everything was wrong, but there, there's some things that I need to, uh, there's things I just taught wrong. And I need to share grace with you. I don't remember my exact words, but that's when the journey began. I remember one time I was, uh, <laughs> I like to read on an electronic device, a Kindle I have, and I was reading, I think it was Best in the Rain, one of Joseph's books, and, and uh, he was talking about how, well, a couple of things stood out to me. He said the Lord shared with him or ask him a question, are you willing to teach this message if everybody in your church left? Yeah. Mm. And then I heard the Lord ask that to me, he's like, what about you? Mm. I said, Lord, I'm willing. Mm. I'm, I'm willing to teach that. <coughs> and so I did. Another thing that stood out to me in the book is that when, when somebody 
had an issue, like they had a financial challenge or just some kind of problem in their life, he said, he would ask the person, is anything wrong with God? They told him no. Is anything wrong with the word? It's like, no. Then what does that leave? You. And you're the problem. I, and, and I used to teach that. Nothing wrong with God. Nothing wrong with the word. There's something wrong with you. And then he shared in that book, he said, there's nothing wrong with God, there's nothing wrong with the word, and there's nothing wrong with you. Come on. Woo! Glory to God. Hallelujah, man. Oh, man. And I threw that kettle up in the air. <laughs> I was sitting on a, on a massage chair, and I threw that thing up in the air, man. It's just, when you get this good news, that there's nothing wrong with you, that God is pleased with you, when you understand, like, I learned at the Bible school I went to, oh, I'm good on time. I went to Raymond Bible Training Center, and, 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 and I learned, I cut my teeth on righteousness by, even before I went to Raymond, Kenneth Copeland was talking about righteousness, and that righteousness was a gift, and I got that. And then I went to Raymond, read this book by E.W. Kenyon about two kinds of righteousness. Goodness, I, I began to learn about righteousness, and, and it was good then. And then when I understood grace, that just completed it for me. I, I got a complete understanding of righteousness, man. And I tell you what, I understood that God is well pleased with me. There's no, there was a little mixture, mixture in my righteousness because, because uh, I was taught that. Sin will short circuit your righteousness. <laughs> and then I, I was also taught you, you never lose your relationship with God, but you, you lose your fellowship when you sin. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that gets us to 1 John 1 9. Now, that, when I saw that, and I'm not going to teach on 1 John, but that, that chapter 1 was written to the Gnostics. Okay, First John one nine is never meant for the believer. Okay, and so and, and Paul in all of his writings never asked one person to confess their sins in order to be forgiven. He also always always pointed people to to their identity, like the the sinningest church, if that's such a word, the Corinthians. I mean, dudes were sleeping with his father's wife, stuff like that, and he was. He was he was just like, don't you know that your body is the temple of the, of the Holy Spirit? He pointed them to their identity, right. to who they yeah. were. Yeah. So good. So, man, when I got the first, because before grace, as a pastor, as a minister, I took, um, like, first John, literally, like, Sister Memphis has said, she, like, you can't, like, if, if, if it really means confess your sins, you got to do each one. Mm -hmm. yeah. right? right? Because I was taught, well, because what about the ones that you didn't know you sinned? Mm -hmm. Well, I was taught, well, you know, the blood will take care of that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, but I learned. Well, before, it was like I had to confess each sin. So if I'm having dinner with Brother Arthur and a, a bad thought, a, a unholy thought came to my mind, sometimes I would excuse myself, go to the restroom, go in a stall, make sure nobody's in the restroom, and then I would, I would uh, ask the Lord to forgive me of that bad thought and then go back to eating. I couldn't even, even enjoy my dinner. And it was even worse and sometimes I didn't go to the bathroom or wait until I got home. But it's on my mind the whole time I'm eating. <laughs> because, see, I'm thinking I've lost my fellowship. Mm -hmm. All right? Because I, I, I wanted to be right. I, 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 I'm a recovering perfectionist. And I wanted to be right. I, I didn't want to have any sin in my life. Right? And so, but when I learned that all my sins were forgiven, past, present, and future. 
that set me free, no more going to the bathroom. <laughs> I still go to the bathroom, you know what I'm saying? But not to confess my sin. <laughs> And it, I, I can't explain to you the kind of freedom that, that that did for me. And that our relationship with God is secure. Our fellowship with God, we enjoy sweet fellowship with him all the time. And uh, that's my story. I got five minutes left. Any questions? <laughs> and, uh, I yield the balance of my time to the distinguished gentleman.